Hello and welcome to the latest in our series of I Formulate Revisited webinars in which we revisit some past conference presentations that we've made over the past few years. And in today's revisited presentation, I'll be looking back at a presentation I made uh, for Chem UK in Birmingham, UK in 2022. It's a big chemical industry trade event for the UK. Um, and the presentation's entitled Formulation Stability. What is it? Why does it fail? And what can I do about it? I'm Jim Bullock from iFormulate Limited. Just something about iFormulate. We're a consultancy helping clients create opportunities and solve problems in the area of formulation. We also help industry bodies develop and refine their strategies with respect to the formulating industries. And we're also involved in formulation training, which can be in person or online. They can be public courses or they can be tailor-made for the client. We've uh, been going since 2012 with over 60 years of relevant combined industry experience between us covering all formulating industries. Uh, and we've got a wide range of experience and knowledge in both technical and commercial areas of formulation, as well as a wide range of contacts. Let's start with defining what a formulation is. There are many different definitions of formulation. Uh, and I'm gonna put a, a number up in front of you uh, today. Uh, the first, which is, is really about a product. So a formulation could be a product which is suitable for sale to the customer. And this product is usually a complex mixture of multiple ingredients, often consisting of more than one phase. For, in, for instance, it might have liquid, gas, or solid phases within the product. A formulation can also be used uh, f to describe a recipe or composition which contains one or more active ingredients as well as functional ingredients. Formulation can also be used to describe the process to combine those ingredients together in the laboratory or in a manufacturing plant. And formulation is also used to describe the enabling technology or even formulation science is, is, is a term that's used. And that enabling technology allows the product to be made safely and effectively. So what kind of products are formulations? Well, I put a, just a range of different sorts of formulations that you might come across um, as a consumer or as an industrial uh, practitioner of formulation. So things like toothpastes and paints, washing powders, uh, pharmaceutical tablets, uh, sprays or granules of agrochemical preparations, metalworking fluids, liquid pharmaceutical prepar preparations, even foods and drinks and, and materials such as ice creams. And I like to start talking about formulation by thinking about the interrelationship between three essential elements to the formulation, which we call the formulation triangle. Um, so on one side, you've got the functional ingredients, um, and that's the composition or amount of each ingredient, their functions and their chemistry, which you have to understand uh, and, and, and recognize the function and the chemistry, the structure that you create, because it's not just the ingredients that give you the properties of that formulation, it's also the microscopic and bulk structure that you can create. And then none of that works unless you do the right kind of processing. So you take these functional ingredients through a series of processes or unit operations in the lab or in manufacturing uh, to create the structure that you want, which enables you to get the properties and performance out of the product that you desire. All of those three things have to work together. If you've got two without the other, then you don't have a fully optimized formulation. So that's formulation. What about stability? We often talk about stability and a question we often get from our client uh, first time we talk to a client is, I've got a problem with the stability of my product. Can you help me? Um, so the first question that we ask back is really around definition. What do you actually mean by stability or instability that you might have seen in your product? And here are some words that you might use to describe stability or instability, um, a short shelf life, 
something's gone bad, it's decomposed, it's settled out, it's separated, the formulation's fallen apart. It doesn't look right, it looks hazy, it looks discoloured. So all sorts of words that can be used, and those very often the first sorts of words that we hear. And why does it matter? Well, quite obviously, if your product isn't performing as it should and it's not stable, then you get customer dissatisfaction, you get complaints, you get potential loss of business. And then it costs. It costs to dispose, to rework or to replace that product. It reduces your overall production capacity. And it also engages people in time spent troubleshooting and firefighting. Let's drill down and define stability a little bit better. Um, and we like to say that the product is stable when its important or critical properties don't change or change very little over a period of time. And it's unstable, conversely, when its important properties change to an unacceptable extent over a period of time. So it's about which properties are important or critical and what is an acceptable extent of change. So what are those important properties? So these, these are critical parameters that you can usually measure or observe. They might be things like color, viscosity, or active ingredient content. They can be performance measures that might be, for instance, apparent to the customer, things like efficacy, feel, or smell. And then you need to define what's an acceptable or an unacceptable change. What will the customer actually accept um, and, and, and recognize as being within the bounds of, of what's expected. You also need to, to define under what conditions you're going to be measuring that change, the time period and the conditions. So are we talking about stability in transport or are we talking about stability in storage or in use or all three? And stability can have many different causes. Uh, quite often we see cases where in the formulation we've got chemical instability. So the ingredients that you're using can break down chemically or can chemically react with each other or interact with the environment in a, in a way that you don't want. So oxidation, pH changes, temperature influences, photochemical effects. You can also see biological instability. So for instance, one or more of the ingredients can be degraded or broken down by environmental microorganisms. And then you can get physical instability. Could there be a change in that physical structure over time? Are those particles stable? So are processes happening like particle agglomeration, crystal growth, settling out, separation? Very common uh, cause of instability for formulations. Um, when you've got these things nailed down a little bit, you ask yourself what you can do about it. So the first thing that we think is really important is to know your product and really understand what you've got. What should it look like? What ingredients have you got in there? What impurities might those ingredients have within them? What's the, the degree of variability? What uh, might be the microstructure that you're expecting to create, those particles and surfaces that you're creating when you when you make the formulation? What should it actually look like? And how should it behave in, 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 in response to effects like temperature or shear or pH or in the presence of other ingredients? What might be the impact of manufacturing variables during storage or during application? And what might be any possible mechanisms for failure of the product? The second thing that we think is really important um, once you're trying to define and understand and solve stability problems is to characterize your formulation. Have you actually made what you wanted to make? And have you defined this properly at the design stage? What, what might have actually changed? And this can be physical characterization. So you might be measuring and characterizing particles. You might be looking at that microstructure. You might be measuring surface properties, bulk properties like rheology or powder flow, um, or, or physical properties such as surface tension. 
you also might need to do some char chemical characterizations, so thinking about ingredient composition, the impurities that you've got there, the molecular weight distribution of polymers that you might have in the formulation, molecular interactions between different ingredients. And then you might want to consider systematic formulation design as an option. And we'll come on to that now. So systematic formulation design, uh, and that's something that we try and uh, understand and, and work through with our clients in the case of instability problems. Um, and really the, the thinking behind systematic formulation design is that prevention beats cure. Decide how your product must perform and then build in a robust design to that formulation. And the first thing you might want to call uh, a customer promise. So you define you know, what claims are you making for your product? What is the expected performance? What are the market expectations or the customer expectations for that product? And then define those critical attributes of the, pro the product, the critical quality attributes, those parameters that you've got to control in order to get the performance that you want. And these might be particular ingredients, particular composition, particular processing conditions. How do you control and measure those? Write that down. How are you going to do that? What's the acceptable range? And what would you do if they appear to move out of range? And you've got a number of different ex experimental design approaches. You can use you know, statistical methods, for instance, to make efficient use of your experimental resources. So doing fewer ex uh, fewer experiments to get the same amount of information out in a given period of time. And also designing in robustness. So if you like it in terms of a performance plateau, you want to be on a plateau somewhere in the middle rather than on a knife edge where if something changes, you're going to fall off the cliff. And then um, you might want to combine um, that approach with science and knowledge to avoid a kind of pure black box, box statistical method. So you might want to use predictive tools, rule of thumb, or even more scientific based uh, predictive tools and modeling and simulation approaches are developing all the time. Let's take a simple kind of theoretical almost case study based on, on real examples. So let's look at microbial pesticides. And if you don't know what these are, these are of increasing interest in, in agriculture, um, really to use beneficial living microorganisms for pest control. And these can have environmental uh, benefits by, by using these rather than purely chemical methods. Uh, you might see these described as biopesticides, biocontrol agents, microbial pesticides, and so on. And these have to be formulated. And a formulator might be confronted with these organisms and, and asked to create a product from them. Uh, these are seen as less environmentally harmful than synthetic chemical pesticides. Typically, these organisms are bacteria or fungi. And some examples here, Bacillus thuringiensis is an insecticide, and Bovaria bassiana is a fungus, which is also an insecticide. So these, these things have to be formulated. And they have to be formulated in a usable formulation format for the end user. And these can be liquid suspensions. These can be oil-based or aqueous suspensions. These can be powders. These can be granules, all containing the microorganism and some other components. And how are they applied? Very often by spraying. So these formulations are diluted in a spray tank, in a water-based spray tank or they may be applied to the seeds before application, or they may be applied directly without spraying to spraying from a tank to the field. So you have to understand what the application method is as well. So let's think about how we might define stability. So we might want to define tests and acceptable limits for the, sort of the key performance parameters. For instance, for instance, you might want to set um, a minimum viable organism, active organism count. You might want to define an efficacy specification with specified application conditions, you know, talking about the pest and the crop that you're going to be working on. If your product is a suspension, you might have a, a physical stability criteria, so no settling or separation in the pack or in the spray tank, for instance. If your product is a granule, you might want to define stability mechanically to storage and transport 
but also the ability of those granules to disperse well in the spray tank. You also will want to define time periods. So these can be minutes to hours in manufacturing, but many months in storage. And in the spray tank, hours to perhaps as many as one or two days, where you will be looking for stability. And then you'll also need to consider relevant conditions. For instance, during manufacturing, the formulation may be subject to heat or shear or pressure. During transport or storage, um, it might be subject to temperature hot temperatures or cold temperatures? Do you need to refrigerate, for instance, in the case of microbial pesticides, to keep those organisms alive? And during application, you're going to be looking at the application conditions, some sort of amb ambient temperature on the farm in the spray tank. You're going to be undergoing shear through spray nozzles. You've got the potential for those nozzles to block. So there's a number of different criteria that you might want to apply. Um, to, to the conditions under which stability has to hold. Think about instability mechanisms next. So chemical uh, instability, you might get those living cells interacting with co-formulants. So the co-formulants that you might use in the formulations, things like surfactants and solvents, for instance, you might want to know that they are compatible. You might get uh, UV light interaction with the active uh, component, pH effects uh, might be important. The effect of oxidation might be important. Then, then looking at physical instability mechanisms, aggregation and settling, as we've said before, of suspension formulations. You might want to consider those factors that we mentioned of shear or pressure used in manufacturing or application, which can you know, damage the cells or cause those suspensions of cells to become physically unstable. And then you've got biological effects. What you don't want is for your microbes to die off during storage, but you also don't want them to grow either. You don't want them to pro proliferate, run out of nutrients, and, and then die before they can be applied in the field. So think about the ability to keep those um, microbes in a state of some sort of suspended animation during uh, during manufacture and storage. Then you need to understand the product, the mechanism of ac action. For instance, in the case of uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, that common uh, bacterial insecticide that we mentioned before, um, your aim here is to deliver the active ingredients, which are the so-called crystal proteins, biochemical molecules that the ba bacteria produce. You've got to deliver those effectively. In the case of Bovaria bassiana, you might want to consider the complete life cycle of the microbe after application. So how is that microbe going to attach to the insect cuticle, the target? Um, how is it going to penetrate and then grow um, within, within the organism? And what about the state of the microorganism? Some microorganisms can form spores, and that's a long-lived dormant stage in the absence of nutrients and, and available water. That's great for a formulator, I think, uh, because those cells or spores of a sensible size need to be formulated. So you might want to formulate um, those spores or cells as a suspension uh, in a form that will not aggregate and, and clog the spray nozzles. So that's a lot of background, a lot of tests that you might need to do. You might need to do some measurements. You might need to define some conditions um, uh, and criteria. And then what might you want to then do to make a formulation stable? You might want to um, ensure, first of all, that your active material, your organism, is inherently robust. So um, those spores that I mentioned could be of great benefit to you if you can get your organism to make them. Um, and you might need a microbiologist to help you um, ensure that you've got uh, spore-forming microorganisms in, in the case, if that's possible for that organism. Um, compatibility testing. So you might want to do a microbiological screen on the effect of potential additives on the microorganism. Uh, you might want to take water out of the formulation so that the organism doesn't proliferate and, and multiply on storage. 
so you might want to formulate with a low water activity so you'll be thinking about solid formulations or if they have to be liquids liquids that have got water binding additives that will reduce the water activity and you'll want the in the case of a suspension the active components to be well dispersed and non-aggregated so that you don't get physical instability of the suspension so you'll be thinking about use of dispersing agents uh, and measurement using particle size information as well you might want to protect against uv light so uv absorbers might be in your formulation you might have in micro encapsulation going on if you can't do either of those two things you might have to think about your packaging and building um, some opaque packaging into your plants and then think about nutrients if uh, once we've sprayed uh, the living organism on the surface of the target whether that's a plant or an insect um, that organism has got to not only survive but it's also got to grow post post application so you might want to include those nutrients in your formulation as well so let's summarize those things that we talked about today on formulation stability first of all understand what your formulation is and what it should be in terms of microstructure its phases and its ingredients think about design stability and designing stability and robustness into your formulation so some sort of systematic design process that we described define clearly what you mean by stability and instability of your formulations what are the key properties what level of change is acceptable or unacceptable what kind of time scales and conditions apply to your application and to your product and then think about what the possible causes of instability are physical chemical biological feelings for instance and then make good use of those characterization tools so physical as well as chemical characterization and that'll be done during formulation design as well as during diagnosis of any problems that might arise so i hope that's given you a good overview of instability in formulation and taken through a kind of a, a case study for you to think about and thank you very much for listening here are our contact details we're always ready to help you with any kind of challenges that you might have in the world of formulation thank you and goodbye <laughs>